All right, there we go. Hi everyone, how's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, a JavaScript podcast about news in JavaScript, basically. JavaScript news podcast, that's what I wanted to say, but uh, I completely messed it up. <laughs> all right, so the um, suggestions from you guys last time was that, uh, first of all, you like the things, that's why I'm continuing doing that. Second of all, you wanted to see more fine-grained and more sort of curated news, so that's exactly what I'm gonna try to do today. I have uh, selected uh, best news this week that I have seen over the duration of the week. I've looked through them, I've read through them, watched the videos and whatnot. And I'm basically gonna give you an overview of the things, events, libraries, news, whatever. So let's start with this uh, sneak peek beyond React 16. This is a video from JSConf Ireland uh, done by Dan Abramov. It's actually from the last week, but I don't know why it wasn't in the news last week because I saw it, but I completely forgot about it. So if I would bookmark it, I would actually show you it last week, but um, there we go. So uh, in this video, he actually goes on to present, uh, let me just mute that really quick, to present the new asynchronous React rendering uh, with some really fancy graphics and uh, very nice demonstration of how the async react will work and how it will actually help while rendering things that are quite intensive, CPU intensive essentially, right? Um, highly recommend to look at it, um, highly recommend reading it and, or I guess not reading, more like looking at the uh, video itself and then maybe having it read through the demo and uh, the some additional notes that there are here. It is very interesting and uh, very cool to see how React develops essentially. There's also very cool um, placeholders that they made. I'm not sure if that's gonna be part of React or some third party library because I think that Dan basically says he's importing that from the future, which doesn't make <laughs> too much sense, but okay. Uh, the idea is that you can actually create uh, placeholders that will auto resolve uh, once the data loads inside of the components, which is really, really cool. I think there's a uh, demonstration somewhere in here. There you go. So basically this spinner is shown whenever there's no data that is rendered within this component and data is fetched using fetch asynchronous API. So the promise, right? And all you have to do to create that is just call one function, which is super impressive actually. So um, yeah, highly recommended to watch that video. That's really, really interesting to see what's coming up next. I'm guessing we're gonna see it in a couple of months, uh, but pretty excited about that. All right, next thing, uh, this is a bit crazy. So this is a WebAssembly experiment, I guess, um, and the service worker one as well. So um, Kenneth Christiansen, um, yeah, I guess Christiansen would be the right way to read that. So uh, he made a, WebP decoder using WebAssembly and Service Worker that works in the background, do not blocks your um, thread, main thread, and actually renders WebP videos into the canvas, which is kind of insane. And there's a pretty large write up here on how exactly that works with the source code and everything. And as you can see here, this is the canvas, uh, we're actually rendering the example. I'm not sure if there's a video link here, I don't remember, but um, there is a full write-up on how he did that, including the source code, obviously. So he used the libwebp, which is a C library and uh, written a C script that would decode the data and then compiled it to WebAssembly and uh, used that WebAssembly in JavaScript inside of a web worker to actually render it into Canvas, which is absolutely crazy that you can actually do that, but we're gonna go, mm, we're gonna talk a bit uh, more about WebAssembly today just in a few moments. So it's definitely a very entertaining and very educating thing to read. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, I highly recommend reading through that. Um, there's yeah, a lot more like experiments and stuff here. So pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Next thing we have here is an article about Jest mocks. I'm not sure how many of you know um, that Jest have a very powerful mocking framework integrated right into it, which allows you to mock functions, mock modules and spy on things. So mocking functions are very straightforward. You just create a mock function using jest.fn method. 
And um, whenever you call it, it will basically have additional methods like you can expect it to have been called, called specific number of times with specific um, parameters, right? So this is very handy for checking, um, for example, callbacks. So you can mock a callback, pass it into a function and make sure this has been called with whatever you expect it to be called with, right? But this is like the most boring part. So the more interesting thing is mocking um, dependencies. So here's an example, very straightforward one. You have a mathematics module, so math.js that has add, subtract, multiply, divide. They all do what you expect them to do. But then imagine you have to test it somewhere, right? So what you can actually do, like first stupid way of doing it would be like to override them inline, which is yeah, a bit iffy and you know, if it's a in de like deep dependency or not testing it directly, that won't work. Um, so what you actually wanna do is you can create special um, file called math.js. I usually do that in a folder called mocks. And you export the same functions, but you mock them in any way you want. So in this case, we just create new mock functions, right? And then once you import the core module, you can just say, okay, just mock math. So it will mock it with the module that you have. And then all those functions inside this module, even if it was required through third party modules will be uh, whatever is in your mocks, right? Um, which is pretty great. And the last thing is the spy on function, which allows you to actually uh, spy on functions without modifying them. So you can actually have a look at um, how they have been called without changing the behavior, which is also can be useful for some cases. So, you know, if you are not familiar with all of that, this article is a pretty great introduction and uh, very much recommended. Right, next thing is um, pretty big article on Google Docs, a web fundamentals page that they have about loading third party JavaScript. So we have a few people in our Discord chat that have been having problems with understanding how the third party scripts work. And this article, as you can see here, it is pretty damn big, it goes very, very in depth on, well, how the third party JavaScript works, how you include it, how do you work with it? How do you make sure it's not harmful? How do you make sure it's cached and so on and so forth. So once again, I think this is more of a kind of pointer. If you're not familiar with that, if you're not familiar with those processes, even if you are, it would be cool to, you know, look through that and uh, actually have a look at what tools are available to make sure that you do it optimally. Like for example, Lighthouse Audit that we already touched in the, um, what was the name of it? In the Puppeteer video, right? So this is what we were talked about the Lighthouse um, reports and this talks about it as well, including the request blocking and some additional performance tools that help you analyze the way that you work with third party uh, requests and third party resources. So all of that is pretty nice. All right, so next thing we have here is an article called How I Build a Superfast JavaScript Framework, which on um, itself is like there is more than one article like this, right? So there is um, actually more than one framework that is faster than React because it's not really hard to be faster than React itself, even with the fibers and everything. The, um, in my opinion, the, the main advantage of React is the ecosystem and the community around it, because, you know, building the framework is one thing, building the community around it and building the ecosystem of resources, libraries and uh, components around it is completely a different story. And this is where React wins on just about everything. And okay, it might be slightly slower, but at the end of the day, I think ecosystem wins anyway, but it's still very interesting to read about the approach used to actually make it faster, right? So there is, again, the whole virtual DOM diffing and all that kind of stuff, including the nice demos, by the way. So I won't load those now because um, like you can watch, you can look at them yourself and there's like source code for um, just about everything. There's like React, React Stencil and, and Ruddy JS, the framework that the author developed. Now, um, what would be interesting actually is to look how that compares to other frameworks that claim to be faster than React. We have at least, let me open a new window. So we have Preact, right? Which is, I think it is actually faster than React itself. And it's like way smaller, right? So um, do they have benchmarks here? That's a good question. So Preact benchmark. Um, 
Rec performance, there you go. Okay, so I think it is, yeah, it's even faster than Mithril, which is insane, which Mithril is a very efficient thing, and Vue.js. And there is it's as well Inferno, which was also a VDOM-based library. Um, I guess we should add Inferno.js because this is how you search for JavaScript libraries, apparently. Um, it's it's also React-like. I don't think it have uh, the same compatibility as a Preact does, but it's also like it was built for speed, essentially. I don't think it optimizes for size, but it does optimize for speed and they do have benchmarks somewhere. Let me try to find it. Uh, benchmark. That was a folder, UI benchmark, there you go. So we have a bunch of benchmarks here and uh, okay, you can actually test them yourself if you want to. Do we have a result somewhere? Yeah, that is isomorphic. Don't seem to have any results here. Okay, but um, second, uh, Inferno JS benchmarks. DB Monster Inferno, see our benchmarks, that's what I want. There you go. So it is only 17% slower than the vanilla JS and about 17% or I guess what about 14% faster than React, right? Um, for whatever reason, Preact here is actually slower than React, which is kind of surprising to me because this doesn't align. Like, the, that doesn't seem to be correct to me. Maybe they use different benchmarks. I guess maybe that's the case, right? So this is the VDOM or the JS benchmark is a simple benchmark comparing typical operations for several JavaScript frameworks. Doesn't tell me much about the benchmark itself, but it seems like um, there's no Preact here, which is also a bit weird. <laughs> okay, that's, you know what, I'm not gonna dig into that, but still, it would be nice to see a bit more comparison here. Although, you know, it's it's always interesting to read about these things. Um, once again, if you're into this kind of stuff, pretty much recommend it. Okay, now we have the controversy or non-controversy, whatever you prefer, of the week. So, um, there was a proposal to rename uh, array method flatten or and flat map to smoosh. Um, that's not a joke. Uh, a lot of people on Twitter saw that it was a joke first time they seen it. And I also was like, yeah, that sounds funny. And then I saw this pull request and well, that's not actually a joke. So the reasoning behind it is that eight year old Mutools, again, this is like fourth time I think Mutools uh, screwed something up in, in sort of in a way that prevented people from naming things sanely in the standard. Mutuals had uh, an array prototype flatten already implemented more than eight years ago and the method signature is completely different, right? So it doesn't align with the standard, it doesn't do the same thing and implementing it in the same way, um, it basically implementing it in a standard way and naming it the same way would break all the websites that use Mutuals. There is a pretty large discussion here going on about renaming and about breaking and not breaking websites. But um, if you don't know that TC39, the entity responsible for new JavaScript entities, they have one major rule to not break the web, right? So they cannot propose and accept anything, or I guess proposing is okay, but they do not accept any new standards that will break existing websites. This is why there is a huge discussion going on um, and uh, it is very big to this uh, degree basically where someone or not someone, I guess it was Andreas Stalz in this case, created um, prevent smoosh repository that has a uh, package that adds prototypes for smoosh and smoosh map that do nothing. And what he suggests is that you use that on your website. And once you do that, uh, TC39 can no longer name those methods smoosh and smoosh map because they will break the web again, right? Even though this is complete bollocks, but technically that's true. So there's been, <laughs> there's been so much crap going on about that. I personally don't like the smoosh methods, but I do understand why they don't wanna have the flatten and um, flat map methods because they will break the old websites, you know, and um, if you take like, especially internet websites that are no longer maintained and has been online for like decade, you know, and nobody touches them anymore because they just work and all of a sudden new browser comes out and that breaks, well, that's not very nice. And obviously people will blame 
people who maintain the websites, administrators or whatever, and they will get angry on the browsers and that's never good. So there were some really cool suggestions, um, for example, import from something. So in this case, they have the import from array, which won't actually work. But there was a better suggestion on Twitter. I thought that was import from uh, std slash js or whatever. So like standard library essentially for JavaScript. That would work. So basically you could only use that uh, method like new flatten, uh, flatten, flat map methods if you are running in ES6. And you know, this kind of makes sense because it's gonna be ES 2019 or 20, whatever. Right, so that's a pretty cool solution. Other suggestions were also interesting. There was like suggestions to use, um, there is a lot of comments in here. Suggestions to use uh, symbols to hide it and also some workarounds using the proxies and people just go crazy about that. I don't know what the final uh, decision will be. So the thread is now locked as you can see here. Um, they decided to just postpone the decision and do a formal discussion during the DC 39 meeting. This is, by the way, one of the solutions as well. So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be um, really interested to see how that results, right? So smoosh name is, <laughs> so I, I, I'm a non-English uh, native person, right? So English is my second language and I learned it from like books, games, whatever. And I honestly did no word smoosh before that. So this is my first time knowing that. And if I would learn JavaScript and someone would say array smoosh, I would be like, what? I would have to go actually look in the dictionary. What the hell does it mean? Because I don't think that's, that's a North American word that I've never heard before in my life. Plus there was some very funny comments about that as being like uh, means to have sex in uh, urban dictionary or something among those lines. So I don't know if that's a good idea, <laughs> but yeah, we're gonna see how that ends up. Right, so. The next thing on again related to TC39 is a new proposal, uh, which is in my opinion, absolutely awesome. So it's, it plans to add the slice notation. It's uh, currently at the stage zero, I think it already has a champion and everything. So the idea is that you will be able to use this slice notation that is similar to uh, what you've seen in Ruby, Python and other languages like this. It's been in Python for ages. I don't know why we didn't have that in uh, JavaScript before, but in my opinion, this is great because, uh, well, I mean, we already have a slice method, right? But this is just shorter, nicer form of it. And some people on um, Twitter, when I posted this was like, oh, why do we need that? Well, because it's just easier to read, right? I don't need to read like and write dot slice because I can just use this kind of notation, right? It's, it's just, it's a straightforward win-win situation. So, and it, it even has the slice number of elements. It's, it's, it's great. I don't see any downsides. That's just, you know, all the upsides from here. And so I'm really looking forward to see that um, in the standard and, you know, if it takes more time than expected, then I'm looking forward to seeing that in the Babel 7, because those guys are typically faster about adding new proposals than the TC39, obviously, because it takes a lot more thought and time to make sure nothing breaks. But um, yeah, gonna see how that goes. All right, the next thing we have here is the strategic initiatives from the Node.js project. So I won't go into too much details, but the idea is that Node is, um, Node has a lot of collaborators, right? So, and a lot of contributors on GitHub. And some of them are from the technical steering committee this is the organization that essentially decides how the whole Node project works. But some of them are just third party people like, you know, contributors on GitHub who just contribute a lot to Node project and but not really involved in any technical decisions. So the guys in the Node thought about that and decided they will create so called community committee that will essentially help in figuring out what kind of features they want to have uh, in the Node.js, right? Or specifically, you can see here as a special um, organized efforts, for example, community events, education, evangelism, um, um, internalization, Node.js collection, Node together, office hours, user feedback. Obviously, those are non-critical features, let's put it this way, because if you see the technical committee still is responsible for stuff like HTTP2 modules and API and all that kind of stuff that is critical to Node itself. But still, it's really cool that they basically acknowledge that there are 
larger community that is not just restricted to technical committee and they allow people to actually influence all that. So if you're interested more, there's like more links uh, in the repositories. I guess they will change over time. So it is pretty cool. And they do explain why they did that. So all this reasoning and stuff. So it's pretty great to see Node develop further. This is uh, like one of the great things. Now, I said we're gonna talk a bit more about WebAssembly today. Well, there we go. So this is a document that describes the design decisions that went into the WebAssembly architecture for the Go compiler. You heard me right, you will be able to write Golang and compile it to WebAssembly. And this is exactly what I've been waiting for and this is amazing. So they are planning to release that in Go 111. And uh, as far as I understood, most of the things actually already work, which is absolutely insane. Um, just, um, I think there was an issue opened with regards to uh, WebAssembly support in Golang like about a year ago, maybe, maybe a bit later, maybe half a year. I think between half a year and a year. And in the very beginning, there was a lot of people who were saying that it's impossible to do because uh, WebAssembly doesn't have garbage collection, WebAssembly doesn't have this, WebAssembly doesn't have that. And now we have this document that says, hey, we, we did it, we implemented everything, which is kind of insane. So they touch on all the points, including uh, architecture, threading, stack machine, control structures, functions, garbage collections, they actually ported Golang garbage collection into WebAssembly, which is insane, but also very interesting because they say that uh, WebAssembly has the plans to add its own garbage collection, but they actually say that WebAssembly garbage collection will probably not yield a better performance than Go's own garbage collector because it's tailored for Go needs, which is, I would be very curious to see the results for that because this sounds crazy. So even uh, if, if they really manage to make a better, uh, basically own made garbage collector for WebAssembly, it's gonna be crazy. Like those guys are some wizards there with the Golang. Um, they already have some JavaScript interoperability going. So you will have the runtime JS package that you can import from and you basically interrupt with the JavaScript, which is pretty cool. And yeah, the conclusion is basically it works and supports the full Go specification, which is absolutely insane. Like it is crazy. I would, yeah, this is something I'm really looking forward to. So we're gonna see uh, whenever the Go 111 is released and uh, if it's gonna be on board, that's gonna be a game changer, I guess. All right, next thing, progressive web apps coming to Chrome apps. So this is something I touched during my last stream where I was talking about progressive web apps and building one and suffering <laughs> while figuring out the service workers that I haven't touched in years. But um, the idea is that you will be able soon to, I guess, get rid of, um, of Electron, right? So this is the end goal of the whole thing. So Electron.js is a Node.js plus browser. You need Node.js because the browser doesn't have access to all the system features yet, but the standards are changing, right? We now have like Bluetooth standard, game controller standard, uh, mouse lock, file system access, whatever you can imagine. I don't know, five more years and we're probably gonna have everything that Electron has and then you will be able to have a progressive web app that will work the same way that Electron now does, which is I think the global goal, um, at least as I envision it, right? I hope the people in charge of it also see it this way because this, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? And uh, the cool thing now is that the, um, so progressive web apps have been gaining traction lately and there's a lot of really cool things happening. So for example, Microsoft Edge will, uh, I, I think it already supports them. And the coolest thing is that uh, Windows 10 will actually start indexing them and adding the progressive web apps that have the manifest and ability to install the desktop right into the Windows store. So you will actually be able to go in the store, find the app, it's gonna be a web app, you just hit a button and it installs and works as desktop app. This is, in my opinion, insane. And you as a developer won't even have to do anything about it. You just have to make a good progressive web app. So um, the Chrome thing is, um, they had this add to shelf for a long time where you had the sort of apps page before they removed it at some point, where you had those like icons where you could click and it would open a website sometimes in a separate window. That all was clunky and didn't work very good. So now they are introducing new thing which is called desktop uh, progressive web apps. 
You can enable it, it's behind the flag. I think they shipped it in uh, one of the latest, like I think the latest update actually shipped it to stable Chrome. So I have a stable Chrome here, let's have a look. Yes, you do have it in stable Chrome right now, so you can enable it right here. I won't do that because it will mean I have to relaunch everything. So I'm not gonna touch it right now, but you can try it yourself. Once you do that, you are actually will be able to um, save the apps as a shortcuts on your desktop and the apps will launch in a standalone windows that are not tied to your browser. So we will actually have this separate, completely separate windows in a taskbar and they have completely separate process and work out of the browser essentially, right? So I don't know if we can see here, there's, yeah, there's the icon here, right? So I think this is the app that we see here and it's it's running with a completely separate icon in a, in a tray, in a completely separate window. And this is all, uh, I guess you could say that it's very similar to what you have now on mobile. So if you ever used uh, progressive app apps on mobiles, you know that you can, you know, open the mobile phone and then the app will say, you know, do you want to add me on a, um, on desktop, I guess, or whatever. I don't actually remember how the prompt is called, but you get the idea, right? Now they're bringing this to desktop. So you can actually build one progressive app app that would work equally good on mobile and on desktop. And then you can turn it into a full fledged app, which is insane. And I'm absolutely loving it. So there's like, or there's already Google Maps Go here. Um, you have to provide the forest PVA flag there, but <laughs> okay. That's a different question. I think someone subscribed. Thank you very much for subscription. I'm gonna have a quick look. And Petkov, thank you very much for the following. Um, let us continue here. Um, so there is some split, what the hell is split screen? There's been a few uh, new spots talking about Chrome OS getting, oh, that's a Chrome OS bit. Okay, Chrome OS bit is something I have zero knowledge of, so we're not gonna talk about Chrome OS here. Although I'm quite excited about Chrome OS getting all the traction because that means that Google will push the web standards more, right? Because the Chrome OS is essentially a big browser with some additional Linux things under the hood. Okay, that's it for the progressive web apps. Um, pretty neat, try it yourself. Um, next thing is the CSS Paint API. So this has been recently added in Chrome 65 as well. So this is the latest Chrome that has been just released. Um, Paint API is a thing that means that you can create your own custom CSS painters, right? So you create a painter class in JavaScript, which draws in essentially the way that you would interact with a canvas, right? So you get a 2D canvas, and then you register the painter as whatever the name you want. And the cool thing is that later on, you can just use it in the CSS, right? So the, for example, here's a, the example they give here is a checkerboard painter. So this is a very stupid thing that just, you know, goes like 32 pixels and just draws, um, you get the geometry size and then you just split it by those squares and you draw those squares using the random color. And this is, if you apply the CSS property, this is how it will look, right? So very straightforward. But uh, when you think about the possibilities of doing that, this is actually really insane and creates for some really cool things that you could do with the CSS and obviously JavaScript. So this is a bit more um, crazy example, I guess. So this is the background for text area. I, you probably don't want to do that in real life, but that looks fancy nonetheless, right? And it's just CSS, so you don't actually have any additional things. I am guessing it has some crazy caching going around. And uh, yeah, so, oh, you can actually even provide the parameters to it. This is even crazier. You actually get, okay, you get the properties, okay. Yeah, so I'm, um, on one hand, I can already see the websites abusing that stuff for doing terrible things. On the other hand, you can get, you know, crazy things like this, like drawing diamonds and, you know, whatever, masks, using images that are like, with special effects in the background or whatever. So, and all of that with CSS, it's gonna be, it's gonna be terrible or really, really good. So we're gonna see how that ends up. Okay, um, now I guess we're gonna go for releases and then talk about some cool packages. And that's basically it for today. So let's start with the releases. The big one of this week is the Fastify goes LTS with version 1.0, finally, finally. It took quite a while for the Fastify guys to make it, but it is now version 1.0 and I can say that it works really well. I've been using it in ExoFrame for the past, 
half a year, I guess. And uh, even, you know, before it was 1.0, they did do break some um, API there, but it was pretty easy to migrate. But it is really, really cool. Like it, it works really well. It's a very good framework. It basically includes everything you need from the get go, very easy to extend. Has nice APIs, uh, sync await support out of the box, HTTP do support. You can throw in any express middlewares in there because it has a complete compatibility. And uh, yeah, there is a lot of really cool features. So if you have not seen it yet, and if you are looking for the next and better, faster web server, then do have a look at Fastify. It is really good if you need to build a complex web app and uh, Express seems a bit outdated because it doesn't support a sync await. So yeah, you know, this is, a, this is basically my framework of choice for complex things right now. Next release, or I guess two releases is actually Node.js. So we got Node 9.8, which added some uh, minor fixes and added a third fingerprint 256 for SHA 256 fingerprinting. I don't think there's any other um, major things. So there's new collaborator and trace. Yeah, okay. So most of this is just minor fixes essentially. So it's a minor, um, this is why it's a minor release, right? So nothing fancy here. Uh, we also have Node 810 LTS, um, which is bringing some big changes. So it has the update for V8, LibUV and ICU and a bug fix in NPM. It still ships with the NPM 5.6. I guess they are still afraid of shipping 5.7 because it broke things. Uh, it also has the OpenSL 1.1, which is great. Uh, so, you know, major or I guess version updates of the dependencies are always great. So it's really cool to see all of that stuff in LTS version. Um, and yeah, obviously V8 6.2, that means performance gains and memory optimization. So it's always good to see that stuff. Right, um, that's basically it for the releases of major well-known things. Now let's talk about some libraries. So I have three of the interesting libraries that I found this week that I personally have not seen before. I mean, you might have seen some of those already. I didn't, so if you uh, do find new stuff, again, feel free to send it to me, I will cover it. So this is the thing called molecular. I'm not sure why molecular, but uh, this is a framework for building uh, microservices, right? Uh, so the syntax seems very nice. And the cool thing is that it actually is completely pluggable. So it's not just a framework built around REST interface or RabbitMQ or Kafka or whatever. You can actually plug in transports, you can plug in serializers, you can even use your own protocols if you want, which I would not recommend by the way, but uh, that's a different things. It has a built-in caching solutions and uh, service discovery, service registry, whatever you can imagine. It actually looks amazingly well made. And you know, okay, it's version 0.12, so it's, I don't know how production ready it is, but it definitely looks like a great framework. I think my next microservice uh, project will be using that. Um, we're gonna see how that works out, but it, it looks very well thought out essentially, you know? So if you're working with microservices, do have a look at that. Hey, Mehmadrix, cheers, yes, indeed. <laughs> All right, um, let us continue. So the next thing is Workly. Um, I've seen, this is a second library I've seen and, or I guess third library. So it's a library that allows you to offload a function or a class to a worker thread and make asynchronous calls to it. So imagine you have some sort of a function that does something very uh, heavy or intense, right? So in this case, this function literally blocks the, um, event loop, right? So if you'll run this in main thread, you will just die until this date now is larger than 200. So that's like two seconds, right? Um, so it's gonna wait for two seconds and then break. And in, if you run it in the main event loop, that will block the browser and just hang it until it finishes. Now, what you do is you say workly proxy, you pass in this function and you can call it with the same parameters and that will actually execute in the background, right? <coughs> Apologies. Um, so pretty straightforward use. You can, uh, so the, the cool thing is that it seems like you can actually even create asynchronous classes, which I don't think I've seen before. So this is really cool. Now I wanted to say that there are two more um, 
what's the name of the guy who makes Preact? So the guy who built Preact also built two other libraries that do more or less the same. So there is a workerize that allows you to workerize modules, right? So the way it works is um, something like this. The thing is here is that you actually have to write the uh, module using the um, template literals, which might be not as convenient as just writing it as a function or a class. And there's a lighter version of it, um, as usual, since it's um, a develop it, um, he's crazy about the sizes. So it's just 800 bytes, which is like insane, <laughs> but it's pretty great. Yeah. And then there's the greenlet, which is a lighter version of that library, which allows you to move one function in a simple way. So this only works with function. And what you do is you just say greenlet, and then you give in the function, which is a sync, and you know, you return the thing, and then you can await this function and it will run automatically in the service worker. Um, works pretty well. I've tried it already in a couple of projects. It does really help you offload some, especially if you do like something CPU intensive uh, to the service worker. So I guess this is also pretty, so this this is the interesting bit in here. So you can do, uh, you can do the same thing with the class, even with the constructor, which is very interesting. And the fact that you don't need to reuse any like, you know, template literals or anything is also a plus. So also seem to have a custom workers. I don't know why would you need that? Um, global objects, so you can create a custom worker, move code there and the worker you can expose your Oh, so you can actually have your custom worker if you want to have some sort of environment. So if your class or function are not um, functional basically, right? So if it depends on the context, so you can offload the stuff there completely. That seems interesting. So yeah, definitely a pretty cool thing. And uh, the last thing I have for today is a tool called Slimer.js. Um, the tool itself is not exactly a new one, um, but they've recently released beta 1.0 uh, beta one. So that I'm terrible with naming things today. And um, so I don't know if you've heard about it, but uh, so we have the puppeteer for Chrome, which is the headless mode for Chrome, right? The simple JavaScript uh, library that allows you to control headless Chrome from JavaScript. And there is also a headless Firefox mode available, right? But there is no convenient library for it yet. And the cool thing here is that they've released the version 1.0 that adds the Firefox 57 with a headless mode there. So you can actually control Firefox using this library. It has a very nice API and quite easy to use. As you can see it's also promise based. So it's pretty close to the um, way that you would use Puppeteer basically slightly different API, obviously, but still uh, very, very nice. So if you're interested in, oh, if you need to say test your products in Firefox and Chrome, you can now do that with Slimer. I believe they do support multiple backends so you can actually switch between them. Some improvements, try beta one. Okay, this is just packages. Let's see the docs, quick start. This is what we want. And you write your own script, you run it with their binary. Now it doesn't seem like they updated the docs yet for that. But anyway, you know, if, if you're into end to end testing, this is a thing that is definitely worth having a look at. But um, yeah, that's basically it for the news from my side for today. I hope that was entertaining and enjoyable enough. Um, if you have any other news that you want to see me covered, if you have the news for the next week, do send them over to me on Twitter, Discord, Facebook, wherever you're reading me. I will happily look at that and, and uh, put it into the podcast next week. If you have any other topics you want to discuss today, feel free to uh, put them into the chat right now. As you can see, chat is on the screen. So we, I am thinking that I actually probably should put all of those links somewhere where you guys can actually find them. And uh, I think it is gonna be GitHub, right? It's, it has to be a GitHub. Um, now here's the question, how do I do that? So let's see. I think we are gonna create a new repo, which is gonna be called BXJS Weekly. Meanwhile, I'm looking at the chat. So if you have anything you wanna discuss, uh, just throw it in there, let's talk. BXJS Weekly News podcast uh, links collection, let's call it this way. 
it's going to be public we are going to initialize it with the readme and uh, i think that's basically it so i want is there a way find file upload files create new file right so can we create a new folder um i guess not right okay so i'm gonna fire up a hyper here and do some cloning and uh editing i guess uh so we can go to projects get clone this thing here so i want to have a folder i guess for the yes i want that um weekly okay make dear so we're gonna have episodes episodes i'm gonna just touch i call it episode one uh, it's gonna be what's the date today 2018 09 md get oh no, no no don't do that get oh what get ah oh, come on Start episodes and yes let's do this get commit m at new episode or links collection all right push i probably should also edit the readme to clarify what the hell is that but uh, i'll do that later i feel a bit lazy about that cool we can close that we can go into episodes we can edit this file right on github and uh, let us insert all the links so i'm just gonna do this doesn't seem like there are any questions, so I guess we can wrap the whole thing up here. Once again, as I said, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Let me know if you're watching this on YouTube as a VOD. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if I should change something, if you have any suggestions to make it better, um, easier to understand, nicer. Maybe I missed something. Um, all right, so you like this format, happy to hear that. Okay, loading third-party JavaScript, close this, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, looks like, you know, it works out pretty well. So we are, I'm probably gonna stick to this. I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's quite interesting to talk about all of that and uh, even, I guess, think about all of that, but because um, normally you just scroll through news and you're like, okay, you know, I got what that means and you skip it. But when you actually have to present it to someone, you have to, I guess, read it more carefully and, you know, actually think about what this means and uh, what the hell is going on in this, you know? All right, so this thing, oh, no, 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 let's not screw it up. Okay, um, I think someone else followed me, uh, log fella, thank you for following, welcome to the stream. Or maybe not welcome, maybe you've been watching for the past 10 minutes and I just don't know about it. <laughs> Nonetheless, thank you for follow. Okay, um, let's see. We got progressive web apps, this thing, and uh, yeah, this is, I probably will prepare those in advance because doing that right now is a bit of a pain and I don't really want to spend time on streams on doing that. Okie dokie. I've been thinking maybe I should just create my own mailing list and just send it to whoever wants it, but first of all, I have no idea how to do that. Second of all, I have no idea if you guys want another mailing list with news, um, which, you know, <laughs> there's so many of that stuff already. Uh, I am doing the wrong thing. So this is no, no, I'm gonna do it this no, no notes. So this is gonna be V980 and uh, gonna be V810 releases, right? And uh, molecular services, let's do this. We got plastic bugs. Thank you for the follow and welcome, welcome to the uh, our stupid, silly streams of things, JavaScript things mostly. All right, uh, almost done, almost there. Uh, so we got workly. No, not here. Workly. And finally, Slimer. I think that covers it. Slimer JS. Okay. Cool, uh, let us preview that to make sure I didn't screw anything up. That looks good. 
So commit changes, right? So yes, if you are interested in uh, having a look for all those links, you can now find them on the GitHub. I probably will, no, I, I mean, I should put a link to the um, this repo. You know what, let me just edit this because this annoys me to no extent. EXJS weekly news podcast. This repository contains links collection for weekly news podcast on JavaScript news. Um, probably is a good idea to link myself here, right? To actually show where the hell is it happens. Weekly news podcast. So I'm gonna do this and that looks good. Commit. Right, uh, much better. Okay, so I'm gonna put that link to this repo in the description to the Twitch channel in case you haven't seen it. Uh, but again, it's under GitHub slash building X with JS, BX, JS weekly. Um, so yeah, uh, as, as, as typical, you can either watch the uh, VOD here on Twitch. I leave them for as long as possible. I think Twitch allows it for like 30 days or 60 days. I also upload them to YouTube. You can find the link to the YouTube channel in the description for this channel. This thing happens weekly on Fridays. On Wednesdays, I have the live stream where I build things that people request uh, in the proposals repository. So feel free to go there and ask me to build other things or discuss other things. That's always fun to do. <laughs> okay, but uh, yeah, we're basically, if you guys don't have anything else to discuss, we're basically done for today. That was uh, pretty productive, I would say, and uh, we discussed a lot of really cool things. Can't wait for that Golang WebAssembly support. Man, I'm really looking forward to that. All right, so um, looks like nobody else wants to discuss any other things. So thank you very much for staying with me. Thank you for your time. Hope you enjoyed this. And as always, I see you um, next week on Wednesday for programming and on Friday for JavaScript news. Bye guys.